This is the WGBH Forum Network. The panelists are Jake Shapiro from PRX, Rick Prellinger from Internet Archives, and Mitch Kapor from Mozilla Foundation. Thanks. Um, I'm first. This is great, actually, to get to be on a panel with you guys. It's an honor. If uh, the weather holds up like this, I vote for a class outdoors tomorrow morning. I think uh, it's really too spectacular out there to be sitting in here. Um, so I was asked to sort of give an overview first of what public radio exchange is. I know it's familiar to, to some subset of you, but not to others. Um, so I'm going to do three things. I'm going to sort of walk through PRX, um, give some thoughts, general thoughts about um, open content business models, and then um, if there's time, I might pitch an idea for a, a GBH YouTube experiment that I think could be done uh, quick and dirty. Um, so I, I'm executive director of the Public Radio Exchange. Prior to that, I was uh, associate director of the Berkman Center, um, where John Palfrey and Eric Saltzman um, from the previous panel um, are also represented. I'm still a fellow at the center there. Uh, my history in public broadcasting is I was a producer for the connection with Christopher Lydon at WBUR uh, back in 2000. Uh, but throughout all this, I've been an independent musician doing a lot of stuff online from the early days of um, uh, MP3s. We had our first MP3s up online with an MIT uh, Sound Lab uh, hosted file in 1996. And we had, you know, best band on the internet in 1999 contest. I won a really cool Hamer guitar in that contest. And my latest claim to fame in that is that our MP3s, which have been out in the sort of open, loose wild of the internet, were discovered by a bunch of South Korean bloggers. Um, which led to a record contract and a tour in South Korea last summer, um, which was our, our surreal sort of spinal tap interlude for, <laughs> for 2005. Um, so PRX is um, an aggregator of public radio programs uh, for distribution, review, and licensing. Um, and the kind of programs we're talking about is anything from like two-minute commentaries to you know, multi-hour um, documentary series. Uh, it was started as a collaboration of public radio stations and independent producers um, supported as a nonprofit um, by CPB and the Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, and some other um, funders. And um, the idea is it's, it's distribution initially for um, stations for broadcast, but then subsequently for digital platforms beyond that, um, and really more uh, characterized as a B2B system um, as opposed to B2C. Um, some of the reasons for PRX, it's the, there's a recognition that there's a sort of missing layer of access and distribution within the public radio system. There's sort of national distribution heading out, um, stations, of course, producing local programming, and then uh, not much in between, not much occupying that middle space. Um, clearly, the Internet and digital technology is affording an opportunity to capture some of the value of, of lots of ephemeral radio that would you know, have lots of investment in it, be, appear once on broadcast and then disappear. Um, and it seemed obvious that it was an opportunity not just to archive that for listeners on, on a site, uh, but to make that available for subsequent reuse for broadcast and other kinds of licensing. Uh, the, some of the mission-driven aspect of it is to actually broaden the sound, access, and diversity of voices that are available to public radio stations and available to audiences. Clearly, with the sort of democratization of the tools of production, um, there's a huge opportunity with more people producing audio. And this is, we started this prior to the podcasting wave, um, and even then it was really clear that there was just enormous interest in being able to use a microphone and a mini disc player to record some stories. Um, and this was a chance to kind of pull those people into the system and give them access um, to the airwaves and stations to get a chance to kind of diversify their sound. And it was also recognized as an opportunity for, to create this open network that brought station, sta station staff, um, independent producers, and listeners together in one space in this kind of collaborative effort to, to reshape public radio, both the kind of architecture of it um, and the opportunities bridging beyond broadcast. So, and thinking about this new space, we sort of plumped ourselves. Of course, everybody has a chart where you're at the middle of everything, and that's, that's, that's where we are. So, <clears throat> you know, we have sort of national and local um, stations and producers, um, but not a lot of connective tissue in the middle, and PureX was really kind of set up to be that um, space. Um, it was also clear that just in between stations themselves, um, there's actually quite a lot of content that gets produced that sort of falls below the threshold of for what's worth um, really marketing and distributing nationally, um, but would have a lasting appeal and some interest either um, sort of topically or geographically to other stations. Um, so this became, you know, part of the reason it was founded um, with support of public radio stations was to encourage that kind of exchange. <coughs> so in a nutshell, the way it works, um, members are, include producers. Anybody can sort of be a producer. Um, public radio stations and listeners. We invite listeners in. Um, anybody can create an account and upload audio to the site. Um, so we don't 
gatekeep at the front end. We actually let anybody go ahead and create an account and upload. We do this sort of post-filtering, and there's a two-tiered system for that. Um, we do have an editorial board where we invite public radio professionals largely and some guests from outside public radio um, to sort of write featured reviews of, of work that's on the site. You sign up for a three-month tour of duty. Um, we pay you a small sort of public radio stipend, um, and you review eight pieces a month. Uh, four are assigned to you, four you pick. And that helps churn through a lot of the material that is getting added to the site. But in addition to that, um, sort of similar to the Amazon-style customer review, you have editorial review at the top and then customer reviews. Anybody who has an account on the site can rate and review any piece. We recognized pretty early on we we're going to be creating a large archive of content. And if it was just sort of a, a sort of database of it, um, the value of, of the sort of context and peer recommendation would be lost. Um, but we also recognized there was something, and we didn't realize how important this would be, um, of a feedback loop to producers for whom in public radio there was really not much of a forum in any consistent way for getting um, any kind of listening or commentary or criticism about your work. Um, so we have basically set that um, two-tiered system up for um, helping churn through and sift through um, the content, but we have decided um, and early on made this choice, and it was sort of interesting hearing um, Jamie talk about this as one of the principles yesterday of, of the openness question of sort of it's not about all open or all closed, it's finding that balance. There's a number of choices in designing PRX where we had to make decisions about that balance, which we're still tweaking, um, but early on deciding that it would be open for anybody to create audio and upload and also allowing listeners in not to upload or download but to review was, was a significant choice. Um, stations who are the primary acquirers but not the only acquirers, um, stations can then come to the site, um, search, browse, audition the full length of any piece. Um, if they're interested in something, they can then license it in their license terms um, that they need to abide by when they click on license. And then we actually give them a, a, a download um, MP2 broadcast quality file um, that they download directly from the Internet um, locally, and then that's what they broadcast. And um, the model there is that they pay an annual acquisition fee um, and then PRX pays royalties to the producers based on the usage um, of their pieces. Um, so the sort of model there is that there's free and pro account tiers. You, anybody can join for free, um, both as a producer, a station, or a listener, um, but your sort of uh, activities are limited in the free tier. Um, if you want to join as a pro, you know, producers pay a really modest fee. It's $50 a year for an individual producer with sort of unlimited storage that you can put work up for. Um, stations pay a fee that's based on their size and budget, which is kind of an accepted public radio practice for charging for programming because of the wide disparity of, of station budgets in the system. Um, that TSR means total station revenue. And then they choose a package of hours. Um, so if they think they're going to use 26 hours over the course of the year, um, there's a little station calculator. They actually can just dial up their own fee on the site, figure out how much it's going to cost, and that's the fee. And the nice thing there is um, they pay once, and you know they're not dealing with sort of single transactions for any of these acquisitions, which was a critical um, sort of barrier actually to some of the kinds of content flow that we wanted to see around the system. It just is impractical to imagine that stations, a lot of whom are at universities, are going to issue invoices and you know deal with um, payments for you know a five-minute commentary um, and try to encourage them to do that hundreds of times a year. It was impossible to think of. So this was a way for us to kind of incent and create a kind of royalty pool um, with single fees um, each year. Um, PRX's model is that we then take a percentage of that. Um, we pay most of it back to the producers and stations whose work has been licensed. Um, the way that we handle the rights is the producer um, you know, chooses the license terms for each piece. They put it up and it's, they fill out a lot of metadata. Um, about the piece, the description, the long description, all these sort of categories and tones and things, um, which becomes very important for us in search. Um, but they also choose the sort of license terms. We give them a kind of a limited set of options that they have to choose within the bounds of, of what we've established. Um, it's like there's, you can't opt out of, um, for example, allowing it to be available for stations for broadcasting for the period of a year. Um, but other things you can opt in and out of. So if we have an opportunity to sell your piece to audible.com, that's something where you would have the option of saying, yes, I'm interested in that opportunity. You might not have the rights to be able to do that, so you have to be able to opt in or out of that kind of a term. Um, the pricing right now is something where you actually set some bounds on it, because we were dealing with a, a marketplace that had no established rates. There really aren't. There are established rates for national shows, like when All Things Considered buys a piece from an independent producer, you know what those rates are. Um, stations certainly know what their rates when they're paying internally to produce programming. But this kind of nebulous market in between of sort of ancillary reuse of some of these pieces directly out to stations, uh, when we researched it, there was really 
really, you know, I mean, the, for the most part, the going rate is zero, and there's a glut of programming. Um, and the idea to try to actually establish a revenue pool and create some sort of expectation of that being something new meant that we had to sort of artificially invent a royalty rate. Um, and rather than let anybody price things at whatever rate they wanted, so some producer might say, my documentary is worth $10,000, and somebody else says mine's free, um, which would have been very difficult in establishing this as a system. We created a royalty rate of uh, 50 cents a minute for a single station use, and it's now a dollar a minute for a single station use, which is not a lot of money. Um, but for the most part, this is reuse of programming. Um, the nice thing is that the license notifications and account transactions, this is all automated. It's all database-driven sites. So um, once a producer has put their work up there, they walk away. Um, a station finds it, listens to it, likes it, licenses it, and the producer gets an email saying, you know, WXYZ has licensed your piece. This is what they say they're going, planning to air it. Um, a copy of that email is sent to the station, so they have a record of it. We get a copy of the email. And so I have this, you know, I was very excited when I set up my inbox to kind of filter all these notifications coming in because it was one of those moments like you see in that Internet ad where you turn the site on and wait for the first bell to ring. <laughs> And, you know, the bell started ringing, and you know, I, I now get sort of a constant flow of email of stations licensing pieces from the site. Um, uh, sort of related to some of the legal stuff, PRX, of course, is a, we're sort of a small nonprofit webcaster under certain terms. So we, when we, for music rights, um, we pay BMI and ASCAP and CSAC just for the ability to have in a very limited fashion um, the musical works that are contained in some of the pieces available for just listeners reviewing them on our site. Um, we also use, obviously, user agreements, which put the, put the burden mainly on the content providers for telling us and the stations that they have cleared appropriate rights for the uses that they're putting the work up. Um, we find ourselves in a position where, of course, we're, we can help advocate for best practices, and there's a lot of education to be done with independent producers in the public radio systems, particularly now that we're migrating beyond sort of the safe zone of um, broadcast. Um, producers, for the most part, haven't ever given a thought to the use of music in particular in their work because that's never been something they needed to clear specifically for broadcast. But as soon as you move it beyond that, of course, as you know, uh, that's not the case. So that's a bit tricky. So for protecting PRX, we do take advantage. I'm, I'm listed at the Library of Congress as the DMCA agent for PRX. I had to fax my you know, thing in, and some, I haven't... You know, I guess I have 10 days for the for takedown notices if uh, somebody did no notice that there was something infringing or told us they thought something was infringing, um, and we could take advantage of the safe harbor. It hasn't happened once. It's been three years. Um, and so I do go on 11- or 12-day vacations, and don't worry about uh, them trying to track me down for that. And then we have our um, multimedia cyber liability insurance policy, <laughs> which... You know, get, waiting through that, finding out that there even such a thing existed, you know, figuring out what we had to tell them for our services and paying the rate for that was a, a bit of a tricky one. But because we're not based at a station, we're not NPR, we're an independent nonprofit that's trying to do this, you know, we're not um, in some of those special carve-outs in the law. So um, we're kind of in the, in the middle there, and we have to be careful about what we do. Um, what's nice now about this sort of system where producers put their work up and, it, and stations can find it is um, it scales very well. We, we are actually a very small team that set this up, and um, there's a lot of stuff that happens a full life cycle without any involvement for us at all. Somebody learns about the site, creates an account, uploads some audio, it gets reviewed, a station finds it, licenses it, downloads and broadcasts it, and we only learn about that when the, I get the license email at the end of the day. Um, which is wonderful to see, and that, that, that was really sort of the, the hope when we set out to establish it, and it was far from clear that that would actually work. Um, here's a, just a look at the site um, as of today. Um, you know, it's all dynamically driven. Um, you sort of on the left, you see these are new pieces that have popped in in the, in the last day, um, new reviews from people, either editorial board or others. Um, you can't really see at the bottom there, but that actually lists um, newly licensed pieces, purchases that are happening on the site live, um, which was a bit of data we always had but didn't want to show until relatively recently when there was enough volume to kind of make it look good. We were worried there'd just be like, you know, one piece license. And it was also one state, it was WCAI, you know, <laughs> Jay Allison down in uh, Cape Cod was licensing all the pieces, so we didn't want to, <coughs> we didn't want to just show that. Um, but now there's enough going on that it's actually really it's kind of like a market snapshot, and people do use it for research. Um, independent marketers are looking at that list. Um, producers are looking to figure out what stations are interested in. Um, and certainly it influences what other stations are thinking about licensing. The center column is stuff that we've picked to feature based on reviews and timeliness um, or other things that have been added to the catalog. And the right column um, sort of highlights special projects that we're doing. 
Um, we do a lot of things around date pegs because it's a great way for stations to think about programming. And as we've aggregated content over the last three years, you know, we have remarkable collections of, for example, Veterans Day programming. We have, you know, all of the best documentaries and short pieces that were created for the 9-11 anniversaries each of the last three years. Um, and it's really a unique collection that a station, when they're going to think about some of their programming approaches, um, can suddenly have access to all of it. Um, at, at, the, at the instigation of a, of a funder, we put together a list of all the award-winning radio pieces um, because they're always interested in, well, you know, I hear about these awards, where are those pieces? So we actually have, uh, as, as new awards come out, um, we make sure that we get those pieces on the site. Um, the site was actually initially developed, it cost us about $100,000. We had outsourced the development to some uh, coders in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, and manages it, just uh, two of us here in, in Harvard Square. Um, we now have a team of about eight people, including three really talented um, developers who are managing it just a few blocks away from here, um, built on open source software and um, something that we're continually improving and expanding and, and trying to build so that it is scalable as, as the numbers go up. Here's a screenshot of um, what a piece looks like. Um, this is from one of the youth radio groups. You can see the sort of various options to listen, to review, to audition or to license or download. All that information is provided by the producer. Um, so the distribution paths, as I was mentioning, the sort of primary focus has been to public radio stations for broadcast and simulcast and online use. Um, but of course, we recognized from the beginning, and it's really starting to emerge to be true now, um, that we would be a broker to other digital platforms now that we're sitting on this kind of mountain of, of uh, over 10,000 radio pieces. Um, so we do have deals with, for example, audible.com and iTunes to put stuff into the music store. Um, on an opt-in basis by producers. Um, we're starting to openly syndicate content through podcasting. And rather than doing something where a producer just podcasts through us, um, we do something where we curate podcasts uh, out of the catalog. So we invite someone to come in and choose a piece each week um, as sort of an editor and then offer that as a podcast. And then there are other license opportunities now that we're um, really starting to sense as this world of digital distribution is exploding. Um, the, the high quality <coughs> level of the work that's in our catalog ends up, ends up being something attractive to, to others. Um, I just got to show this slide because this is, I think, David Leroff's one of his favorite ones. This is, this is, uh, this is what we call the hairball. It's not, you're not supposed to actually be able to see it. But it maps the transactions between stations um, that have happened on PRX. So this is, each of those represents a station that has actually licensed, sold, or bought a program from another station. So we just feed some of that data into this really cool mapping program. And we're starting to look at doing this for some of the other social transactions that are happening on the site, reviewing, visits, that kind of thing. Um, it's just a great example. It's sort of a... You know, it's, a, it's evidence of sort of this, this space that prior to, to a, a tool like this being available um, really didn't have that kind of network effect that is now possible and that you can imagine layering on top of even within the sort of business to business side of, of public broadcasting, never mind when you start to imagine what the other nodes of connection that we have beyond it. Um, I'll share some quick numbers. Um, we've got about 400 stations um, on the site, about 1,400 individual producers, 180 producer groups. You can sign up as an organization. Um, about 17,000 listeners have signed up um, with free accounts to be able to review things. About 11,000 pieces have been added to the catalog. Um, over 10,000 pieces have been licensed um, at least once, which is great. And about, we've paid out about a quarter of a million dollars in royalties um, to over 650 producers and stations. And some of those checks are, you know, $5.00. Um, and some of them are, you know, several thousand dollars, um, but most of it is, is really new revenue um, for the kinds of things that we're talking about. A um, couple projects I just want to quickly uh, talk about before I'll wrap up and, and move along. Um, we're doing, we've done something called reversioning, where we took some of the matching money we had from CPB um, to basically help producers who had some work that was off the shelf, something that was in the archive or just needed a little bit of tweaking or some new promos or needed to be somehow edited um, to put back into circulation. Um, and that was ended up being a, a, an excellent way into sort of a match between the marketplace and, and a reason to put it out there. Um, so we put out a simple RFP, a little sort of web-based form, said, what's the, tell us about your project, um, what would you need to get done um, um, to get it out there, you know, from $500 to $5,000 of funding. Um, and so, for example, um, one of the best, one of those great public radio shows from back in the early 90s called Heat uh, they, with John Hockenbury, the, the guys who had produced that, um, said, well, well, we could actually go back into that, take 10 of those episodes, update them a bit, get them ready for as like a limited series and put it back out. And so that's going to be debuting on WNYC and some other stations in the fall based on this project. Um, and, uh, and we ended up funding about 
uh, 40 different projects out of 100 applications that came in over two weeks for exactly that kind of work. And I think that that's, there's, there's ripe opportunities for just that level of, of investment and sort of tipping the scales to get some work that's sort of sitting, lying fallow um, out there. Um, curated podcast, this is the idea where we have one, for example, with the Nature Conservancy that they're sponsoring it, where they pay for a curator's time to go into the PRX catalog, choose an environmental piece each week, record an intro to it, and then we syndicate it out as a podcast. And it's this idea where um, they're paying the freight of it. It's sort of original content they wouldn't have been able to produce directly on their own. It's, in it's including a number of producers whose work is being included in the podcast. The curator gets an interesting kind of DJ gig out of it, and then there, we pay, are able to pay royalties back to the producer, and we think that's actually an interesting model for us um, rather than doing it ourselves to kind of be the distributed um, version of uh, connecting the dots. Um, Generation PRX is um, an example of a, of a youth, it's a youth radio project. We're using the PRX platform um, to support what's now become this kind of emerging field of dozens and dozens of youth radio projects around the country, the most well-known ones being at WNYC Radio Rookies and Youth Radio in Berkeley. Um, but there's actually now many more starting at high schools and after-school programs. And the idea was both to give them more opportunities for distribution, but also to use the peer review system to help educate and train and learn more about it. Um, I, I'm going to steal a minute and a half to play a little bit of um, some youth radio because we don't get to listen to enough tape in these kinds of conferences. Let's see if this works. Thanks for coming in. They don't think about what it's like to leave their homes in the first place. I do. Because one day, I might have to leave my home in the mountain. I live in Jeremiah, Kentucky. For generations, people in my family have moved from state to state for jobs. We put their lives at risk in coal mines. Here, leaving the mountains is a lot of passage. Just like crossing the border, not being broken. I do kids every day making plans about their future. And East Kentucky is a part of that. I never thought I had anything in common with two people from other countries. Just one bit more. For me, the weekend is a chance to take life at a slower pace, lounge about, watch TV, and play the guitar. It would be perfect. But an annoying question arises each weekend that jars me from my every world. David, do you have any homework left to do? <laughs> every Friday after school, I have a discussion with my father about when I'm going to attack the mountains of work that my teachers have thought Okay, uh, well, there's, there's some more there, but it's just an example. There's some, some wonderful audio that's, that's coming out of the youth radio groups and doesn't sound like public radio as we know it that we're hoping to be able to tap into. Um, some of the next things for PRX is to extend the network beyond broadcast for more of these digital um, opportunities. Um, the idea now that we have an, you know, sort of a catalog of, a sort of an atomized catalog of thousands of pieces to think about how to package, present, perhaps turn these into streams of content rather than relying on stations to do the assembly themselves. That seems like a clear opportunity and something where you know we're actually in a great position to help see where the opportunity would lie. Um, the sort of uh, Jay Rosen new assignment.net idea that um, I'm, hope, I'm hoping a lot of you have heard of. We've also thought of using the marketplace of PRX not just for stations to acquire existing work, um, but to be able to pool money to actually commission new work um, and perhaps some sort of a bid process where. Um, either a station or a producer would be able to pitch a story that needs to be covered, and we could use the system to actually aggregate the dollars to get the work produced um, that otherwise would go um, unproduced. And so actually th that's an interesting application of, of the system. Um, I'm running over, so I'm going to just sort of stop here and then hope that there's some questions at the end and pass it over to Rick. Thank you. Just waiting for screen time here. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm. It's a privilege to be here. I wanted to thank our our hosts and our benefactors. I'm learning a lot about public media, and um, I'm also, uh, you know, getting a, a, a strong feeling that anything we can do to make it less precarious is uh, is important. And in a lot of ways, that's the spirit in which um, I'm going to talk today. Uh, some of you, many of you may have heard about this. This is Larry Lessig's idea of counterposing a model of plenty to the model of scarcity that surrounds 
um, intellectual so-called property, which you know many of us think isn't, isn't really scarce and can't be scarce. Um, what I'm going to talk today isn't so much going to be about ideology. It'll be really trying to construct a business case for this. Um, I'm going to take as axiomatic that this is a good thing. This is apple pie, open content. You know, something I don't really want to argue with. Um, I had a, 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 a brief and uneventful career in broadcasting. I worked for HBO for 5.84 years. I think that's what it said when my job was eliminated. Um, and one of the things that I learned at, at HBO is they, you know, I suggested all kinds of crazy things and they said, you know, Rick, we, we like to hit home runs here. And so there's the home run problem, which often uh, deters us, I think, from doing things that um, might be labs, sandboxes, playgrounds, boot camps, experiments. You know, people's compensation usually isn't based on, on experiments. But on the other hand, um, let's adjust to the fact that archives are there and let's try to put them into the foreground rather than just um, carry them as, as a weight around our neck. You know, people who like sort of seem to be doing something, running the archives, but who basically exist as resource people, as passive people that you call on when you need them, but aren't really, really involved in pushing stuff out to the organization and to the world. What I'm going to suggest today is that we use archives to bootstrap a two-tier system, and I'm going to talk about how a two-tier system has, has worked for us, the notion of giving away um, something in order to sell another. Um, this is wonderful public policy, but on the other hand, back to apple pie, you can't force anybody into it. I'm, I'm definitely... Uh, down with the people today who say that, that this should be, um, this has got to be voluntary, this has got to be consensual, this is an issue where positive reinforcement is needed. You shouldn't put people's material or material that people are heavily identified with online without their agreement. Um, this is us, you know I'm wearing two hats here, I work at the Internet Archive but I'm also a recovered <laughs> archivist. Uh, I, I ran Prelinger archives for quite a number of years. This is some of the basic statistics. I think the key things to point out here is that we had a great deal of public domain material. We owned a few copyrights, but we were primarily older public domain material, historical films that were not produced under union conditions that were not encumbered. We didn't have to pay residuals. Um, and at the bottom is, is sort of what we think we did in 2005. Believe it or not, I don't really know. That's why we have the wavy equal sign, because the way that the Getty, uh, the, the Getty images um, uh, splits go, it's a little hard to know exactly how we did. But we're small to medium. In 1999, I moved to California. I was a New Yorker. I wasn't socialized yet in the West Coast culture of communitarianism and open source, um, but I talked to Brewster Kale because I was trying to, Danny Hillis suggested to me that he might be able to help me find a wealthy person who would help finance the acquisition of my archives by a nonprofit. And the first thing he said to me after about 20 seconds of telephone time was, oh, last night we were sitting at dinner trying to figure out where we could find a film archives to, to put online for free. How would you like to do that? You know, it was a very quick seduction, and um, except that I played hard to get because this was completely against my nature. I started to sound like, you know, Jackie Gleason. I was babbling, stuttering. This is how I make my money. I don't know from this, this free stuff. But after about three months, I decided that he was potentially right, and I decided to do an experiment. I was feeling a little contrarian, and I agreed to put up uh, digital files of initially 1,001 films. There was no reason 1,001 was better than 1,000. And um, in January 2001, the first films went up. A few months later, we were slash dotted. I think in February, the site broke. Immediately, we put up some more um, capacity. And we started to give away an incredible number of films. This is where we're at right now. We're just hovering under 2,000. Um, I won't talk so much about technical stuff today, but let me just say this. What we put up is near DVD quality. It looks pretty good. It's... Um, it's, it's, it's low bandwidth, MPEG-2, and there's a couple of compromises so that it's kind of hard to bring into the Avid, but it's like really perfect for people who are doing independent work and uh, non-commercial work. Uh, more about that in a second. It looks really, really nice when you play back on the screen, and you can also burn to DVD. Um, and down at the bottom, key thing, Creative Commons Public Domain License. I made the irrevocable 
declaration that we were going to stand by the fact that this material was public domain. In some cases, we did own rights. Most cases, it was PD. And so we basically let it go. Here's what we did, and this is probably my key slide of the day, two-tier licensing system. Um, what you get for free is nothing but a download. If you pay, you can have a physical copy in whatever resolution you like, up to and including um, HD. You get a Creative Commons license for free. This is a very good thing. We support it and we love it. But you know what? Uh, e and O carriers don't think that much of Creative Commons licenses yet. So if you pay, you get a specific written agreement with your name on the top. And in fact, um, it, it wouldn't be inaccurate to say that I'm now in the business of selling licenses. So for free, you indemnify yourself. You self-insure. You know what they always tell you not to do. Um, if you pay, you get reps, warranties, and indemnification. Um, if you pay, you get research services, usually from Getty, unless people pester me, because Getty Images reps us. Um, if you, it, it's essentially it's do-it-yourself versus value added, and this is a paradigm that I think maps over to all kinds of, 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 of content, and um, we didn't plan it this way. This is what we discovered after doing it. Um, here's a little table of some access events, and you can see two of these are, are estimates, but I think that they're reasonably accurate estimates. Um, over six years, we multiplied the number of billable events by three. This has nothing to do with the Internet Archive site um, specifically. Unpaid production usage, there were 20 sort of lonely freebies in 1999, which meant that I actually had to go through the motions and give people film or tape. Last year, I think there were about 6,000. Um, and then in the lower right-hand corner, we, we, uh, our server statistics say that we served up 2,000, 2 million films to the public in 2005. And that doesn't include things that were re-hosted or that propagated um, from other people uh, than the Internet Archive. And we think all told we've had about 6.5 million films downloaded, which is pretty good when we're thinking about films, you know, on the level of uh, duck and cover, parade of invertebrates, uh, you know, um, Chevrolet Leader News, 1935. Here's who's using the collection. Um, you can read through this yourself. Some of these are very high profile people. The corporation used 100 video and audio clips that they downloaded. They were able to use material that was, um, uh, was degraded because they did a lot of sort of stylized stuff, you know, a lot of rear projection, a lot of um, compositing and matting. And you could argue that these are people that should have paid because they had a production budget, a Canadian production budget, which isn't anything like we have in the States, but it was a budget. But what I've come to accept is that there's going to be some slippage, but that, um, and there's, it's very important to say there's always going to be slippage when you give things away. Somebody said before, when it's on the internet, it's out in the world. You know, um, you can't police everything. And I've come to accept the slippage because so much more happens. Wait and see. I'll tell you in a moment. Um, artists, educators, a lot of this is stuff that shows up on the web. I, I love what the college students are doing. I keep running into people who at screenings or people who send me DVDs of stuff they've done in class. I was in the Minnesota Science Museum. I saw one of our films playing on a monitor. Church groups and homeschoolers. This is uh, a little bit strange, but they love the the homeschoolers love the 1950s educational films <laughs> because it's a world that's homogeneous, perhaps with a kind of world. That, I mean, and not all homeschoolers are like, but that is a significant group. I get a lot of letters from them. Um, there's some stocks footage festivals. There's been some others since I, I made this slide um, where everybody gets 30 to 40 minutes of, of Prelinger footage and everybody has to make a film out of the same footage. And, uh, you know, it's just this wonderful example. It's almost a, a, a Buddhist thing about the... the, the, the uh, Inf infinity comes out of limitation. And then I'm going to be completely honest with you. The bottom line here is that a lot of people put out cheap, low-quality DVDs of stuff that they've downloaded from our collection. Um, they don't pay a penny. The, the good news is that they don't sell very many of these. Um, but it's, you know, this is the one consequence I would have preferred to avoid. And it puts me in an interesting position because the way for me to squelch that is to put out 
high quality DVDs that have a lot of curation, a lot of supplementation, authoritative, interesting writing around them, and we've been talking to people about that. But the issue is that I have to do that. I have no choice now. And I'm being completely candid with you. This is the one negative consequence. But it's, it's not hurt us financially. Getty doesn't like me to talk specific numbers about what they pay. But, but these are the statistics. Um, so in five years, we've seen a 74% increase that money that, in, in money that comes to us. Um, this doesn't all have to do with the visibility and with the other things that come from making our stuff highly visible and extremely available online. A lot of this also has to do with Getty getting its act together. But I think we can say that a large portion of this increase, which includes the 9-11 slump, which was not very good for the stock footage business, um, I, I think that we can say that a lot of it comes from this visibility, and we're very, very happy about that. It means I don't have to work very hard. Um, ubiquity equals value. When I, when I worked at HBO, I had some long conversations with other Time Warner brothers and sisters, and the, and the woman that ran the Time Life picture collection, I sat her down once and said, what's your highest revenue producing image? And she said, that's easy, Rick. It's the 3D movie audience. You know, everybody sitting in the, in the theater with glasses, very famous image. This is also the most pirated image. It's emulated. It's been reshot. It's been made over as a moving image, but they make a lot of money off it. And, you know, to me, it's the stairway to heaven issue, right? That song hasn't lost value by being played every 20 seconds somewhere in the United States and the UK. And I think we really need to, to, to rethink the notion of scarcity, premium, and exclusivity when we're thinking about archival uh, content. You want to own the cliches, and if you don't own them, you want to create them. What we're doing here is using the, the, using the free, t and you know, I'm not disparaging cliche, that's a neutral term. There's, there's good cliches and bad cliches. Um, what we're doing here is using the free tier to promote the pay tier, and, and to some extent the other way around as well, because when people see something in a paid context, they'll also search for it. Um, I've become a real believer that trends move upwards, that the kind of people whose job it is to choose imagery for commercials, music videos, movies, uh, even, even cable and historical, are responsive to the zeitgeist. They look around and see where's the visual color you're at at any one moment. So the more that our footage is seen there, the better it is for our collection, the better it is for all archival collections. Um, what I think this means is that we should expose archives to the maximum extent possible and not just expose them through streaming or letting our metadata be exposed. We should let people touch them. The tools for people to touch archives and to work with archival material are now quite ubiquitous. ubiquitous. So visibility is, is the way to move from risk to opportunity, I think. Here's some less tangible ideas because I have you all sitting in front of me. Users are your best salespeople. You know, I'm amazed the stock footage industry, and I'm not going to point out any companies in particular, but they have this huge sort of semi-parasitical layer <laughs> of salespeople who all make six-figure incomes, and they haven't figured out a way to get their users or to enlist the public in promoting their collection. It would be a lot cheaper. Today's remixer is tomorrow's licensee. I know this because people who use the collection when they're 20 get jobs in the media, and they come back and license stuff when they're out of school. So we have this cadre of young archival devotees. I've literally been stopped in airports by people that say thank you. And there is indeed a band in San Paolo called uh, the Preliger Archives Orchestra. <laughs> they have a MySpace page. Their music is not you know, so great, but I signed them up as a friend anyway. So we're the, <laughs> so we're the only archives that's had a... Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know yet of the, of, of the Corbis combo. Um, one thing that I think we're all going to need to do, and most of us haven't done it. It's been done on the, on the major social networking and video websites, but build networking in. I love uh, Paul's uh, mail to button and the creative archive where you can send a postcard. I'd also like to suggest that if you're doing something um, with mostly licensed material, that you can pep up a collection with PD material. But overwhelmingly, this is something we talk about at the Internet Archive a lot, where we're doing book scanning. How can we make it cool to use the public domain? How can we make it cool to use open content. That's the place where people can be. So take them out of the walled gardens and, and, and um, 
and just make open content hip. We talked about segmentation before I raised it. I think it's a really, really big issue, both on the supply side and in thinking about usability. Um, we haven't done hardly anything with it at the Internet Archive. Um, I'm the first to admit that it's just really an idea we need to, or we need to work with somebody else who's going to do it. Um, it used to be that younger people supposedly, you know, our friends at Nickelodeon who we sold footage to said kids don't like black and white. And I said, I don't know that that's true. How about the checkerboard effect? Um, but from what I can tell now, historicity is no longer alienating. People aren't worried about scratches, about black and white. It's much more the, 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 the content. I'm more worried now about whether fragmentation will alienate, alienate an older audience. Um, if you're into branding, and even if you're into trying to um, aggregate or, or pull material together under some kind of umbrella, it can be really hard to work with um, bits and pieces. You know, it's like what they say about dieting, that broken cookies don't count. Um, <laughs> my personal critique of TV, which is a little bit unkind possibly, is that TV's not very good at underpackaging. And yet, in this case, when you're building uh, open content collections for people to do something with, you kind of want to underpackage, you know? And that's hard. And then a question Paul raised uh, yesterday, I think, when does archivalness kick in? You know, is it an hour after airtime? Is it a day? And by the way, when does it kick out? When does something you put up online for fairly open um, use, what's the sunset on that, if any? And maybe by having a sunset on some material, you buy time. Uh, another favorite slide. We need to sit down and figure out where we want to put this bar in the middle. Uh, and there's a lot of stakeholders, and the public is a really important stakeholder that nobody ever, nobody ever asks them what they think. But if we can figure out where to put this bar, it would really, really help us um, define new business practices. It would help us think about new legislation that reflects business practices that actually occur in the real world. What's for free and what's a, a billable event? And I'd love to figure out some way that. Um, you know, an ex a pluralistic group of people can sit down and, and talk about that. Experiment. You can always go back if you have to. And um, I didn't want to shout it out at the bottom. But if you experiment and you work with commercial partners, please ask them some really, really hard questions. Like, is this open? You know, what are we trying to do? What are you trying to do? What are the shared interests? Where does public policy fit into the contract? This is hard when... Um, Many of commercial partners come to uh, us with NDAs that we have to sign. You know, only those of us in this room who've signed NDAs, you know, know who we are. But it means that the discussion can't be totally free. And I think it raises an issue when we're talking about public media and the public trust. And I thank you. Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of trouble with technology, so I don't know if I'm going to get this to work. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. So thank you. Um, I decided to call this not business models, but models, because I wanted to take uh, my uh, time here to try to reflect on some larger uh, issues about the context in which all of this shift towards open content um, is happening. And, and I hope you'll take what I have to say in the spirit of sympathetic provocation. So to quote Admiral James Stockdale, you may remember he was Ross Perot's vice presidential candidate who famously in a debate said, why am I here? <laughs> who am I and why am I here? Um, I wear a couple of hats. Uh, I'm active in the open source software movement as the chair of the Mozilla Foundation, uh, the founder of Open Source Applications Foundation, and I'm an advisor to the Wikipedia Project. Uh, these days, I mostly focus on issues of governance and sustainability. In other words, for nonprofits, what's the business model? Um, I also have uh, a lot of experience as an entrepreneur, an angel investor with uh, many generations of disruptive technology 
going back to the personal computer, I'm the founder of Lotus, uh, early investments in internet companies, streaming media companies, and most recently, virtual worlds, so these online 3D shared environments, but that's a talk for another day. Um, I should also note that I have a very small career uh, in the media. Uh, out of college, I was a, a, a radio disc jockey on WHCN FM in Hartford, Connecticut, for a couple of years, and I went on from there to um, change careers, and I was a mental health worker in the psychiatric unit of a, uh, uh, of a hospital in the Hartford area. And uh, um, I got a tremendous inspiration how I could make a big contribution to the field of human services by getting out of it, and that's actually how I got into, uh, in into computers. <laughs> Where everybody's okay. saying right. So the context for the talk uh, and I'm very glad I had a chance to come in early this morning because I, I think that there's a lot of shared context here so I can, I can go more quickly, uh, is that information and communication technology is driving something between evolution and revolution in our media ecosystems. I, I don't think that's controversial. I would observe that in nature, when you have one of these discontinuous changes that happen periodically, the native and dominant species uh, in the before world um, ignore change uh, at their own peril. Uh, and that what seem like some quantitative changes uh, result in qualitative shifts. And we're actually going through that on a very large scale in our society right now with the issue of global climate change, and we'll see what the outcome is. But the, the takeaway for people is that in, in punctuated equilibrium, life goes on, but some species become extinct, and that is something to, to uh, meditate on. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was also a DM teacher. <laughs> So there's a phenomenon um, of uh, disruptive innovations that characterizes these changes in technology uh, that, that we've seen. Um, this has been, I think, named by Clay Christensen at uh, the Harvard Business School, who's written a wonderful book, uh, multiple books now, called The Innovator's Dilemma. Originally, he studied uh, changes in uh, the performance of uh, disk drives, but this is a very general phenomenon that also applies to the type of displacement the iPod made of, of the Sony Walkman and, and, and perhaps Sony. The characteristics of these changes are that at the outset, there's something new comes along and it has novel functionality, and it is always lower in performance and quality when you compare it against uh, the, the, the conventional standard. So, I mean, the quality of video, you know, streaming on the internet is still markedly inferior to what you can, what you can get otherwise. Hence, um, the new thing is always inferior to meeting what the existing requirements are. And that can be very misleading if you just sample a point in time, because it's the nature of these disruptive innovations that at their maturity, they're equal or, in fact, typically superior in performance they wind up enabling uh, new use regimes. People can do all sorts of new things that they couldn't do before, and they wind up displacing, typically, whatever was in charge previously. So um, the dilemma for anyone who is an incumbent is uh, what do you do about this? And the problem is that the success factors, the very things that made one successful previously, can now be the causes of failure. Um, and I want to illustrate in a minute with a, a personal story. I first experienced this with, with, with PCs going back to the late 1970s, buying an Apple II uh, computer. Remember, I was unemployed because I'd quit my job at the, at the mental hospital. And it was very clear that an early personal computer was a laughable substitute for a mainframe or even a mini computer. It simply had it could not do any of the things that people then usefully did with, with computers, and they were entirely dismissed as, as marginal at uh, places like MIT, which is where I was uh, at the time. On the other hand, innovative applications came along that hadn't even been conceived of, like the spreadsheet, which created uh, a whole new industrial ecology uh, around it. And eventually, PCs matured in their technical capabilities so that there weren't the compromises vis-a-vis -vis the older machines, and it then enabled the PC architecture is what dominates or has dominated all of computing. I should say now we're seeing uh, perhaps the wheel turn uh, again, and the PC is uh, you know, 
being threatened to become obsolete by devices like this. So there's uh, no, no resting on one's laurels. But that you know, really impressed um, a huge lesson on me. I lived in Boston for 25 years. And I came of age with these huge mini computer companies, Digital, Data General, and Wang. They were the, the titans of my industry, and they're all gone. They're like a, a forest of uh, mature trees, and they all died at the same time because those companies were just uh, unable uh, to make the shift. And I remember, it was a formative experience for me, meeting Ken Olson, the founder of Digital Equipment, uh, being summoned out to have an audience with him. I was just still a, you know, a... I was a kid, and he was railing about the deficiencies of the IBM personal computer, which I was fond of because that's what we built Lotus 1, 2, 3, 4, but the basis of his critique was that the case was flimsy. It was not an industrial strength metal case like the one that he had designed for digital's own computers. And I, I, I left. I mean, my world had been turned upside down, but I, I understood that he was a serious and smart guy, and having a good, strong case was a very big deal when you're putting your equipment in, in, in labs and scientific equipment, but when you're talking about uh, uh, the market for uh, desktop computers in business, it was completely, uh, completely irrelevant. So how does all that apply? I think I thought when I was preparing this, this might be more controversial, but I don't get the sense that it is. That if you, the proposition here is if you look at what you can do over the internet, what people are already doing, plus advances in digital media, it represents a disruptive innovation vis-a-vis -vis television. The whole system, how it's made, how it's distributed, and all of that. And there's a set of dynamics that are very different, and I've heard a couple of speakers mention them, so I think we're probably all more or less on the same page. It's moving from a world of scarcity to uh, abundance, scarcity of spectrum to uh, abundance of, you could have, uh, how many films are in the archive that you could download, from having to deliver things in real time to being able to get what you want on demand, from products which are one size fits all to highly personalized products, and from a style of uh, experiencing that uh, switches from, from passive to active. The question is, what does this shift mean? And that's what I want to focus on. And the way I want to focus on it is to talk about a couple of things that could only have arisen in the context of the Internet, I would argue, were not even conceivable. So kind of pure Internet, they're not quite media, I'm calling them works here. One of which is the Linux operating system, and the other of which is, is the Wikipedia. And in a minute, I'll just have one slide on each. But they share some characteristics, even though one's an operating system that runs on servers and another is an encyclopedia that is free for everybody to use. If you look at how those things are produced, especially in contrast to how a conventional operating system or conventional encyclopedia is produced, the production is highly decentralized. Uh, and in fact, it is very democratic in the sense that it is produced by a community of people who are largely self-governing. So it is a, a radically different uh, production model. There is little or no hierarchical authority in either of those communities. And when I'm trying to be very provocative, I'm not nuanced, and I say there's no hierarchical authority. But in fact, the reality is that uh, Linus Torvalds, who has created Linux and is still at the center of it, and Jimmy Wales, who is the founder of the Wikipedia project, both literally have final cut. They, analogously to final cut in a movie, have the final word on what goes in and what doesn't go in. Uh, they tend not to use that uh, a lot, but they have it and have used it, and it is not uh, a mob rule. The ownership of these works is, I said, vested for the public good. It operates more like a commons than a market in the sense that uh, both Linux and Wikipedia are freely available uh, with um, a minimum uh, of, of restrictions. And the user experience of, of Linux and the Wikipedia, especially in contrast to their more conventional predecessors, is much more participatory in the sense that 
the, the user, there's much more fluidity, we could say, between consumers and producers. It's not simply that one consumes passively. One can start that way. But there are many pathways to becoming more of a contributor that are, are very incremental. So on the Wikipedia, people often start editing by fixing typos that they notice. So these types of works simply don't exist, haven't existed prior to the, the current day. Um, just say a couple more things about, about Linux. Very much a product that came of age in the 1990s, created and maintained by a global network of volunteers, um, freely available not only for use but for uh, uh, improvement. And to this day, it still has a rather informal project governance. There's no uh, Linux Inc. Uh, there's no nonprofit Linux anything. Uh, but yet, despite the profound skepticism with which Linux was <laughs> greeted as it came of age, that it would never amount to anything serious, it has become integrated with and is vital to the entire software industry. And IBM's entire business is now built on Linux and other open source projects. So we don't have the time to go into that case study today, but it's a remarkable story of how something that started as completely outside the mainstream has actually been integrated with it. If anything, the Wikipedia is, is e even more of a radical departure because it's really not possible, short of seeing it in front of your eyes, to believe that you could have a set of unpaid volunteers with very little coordination create in five years uh, an encyclopedia with 1.6 million articles that's actually useful uh, and, and in which any article can be edited by anyone at any time. In fact, it's utterly uh, counterintuitive. And uh, all I can say is it can't possibly work, uh, but it does. And um, time doesn't permit going into it. If there are questions, we, we could talk about that a little bit. But what I would say here is there's a very unorthodox division of labor in the Wikipedia in that there's no formal distinction between the experts on a subject and lay people, between people with credentials and people with no formal credentials, and no expert between professionals and amateurs, which in the context of an encyclopedia typically means between professional academics and, and people with an interest. Now, this is extraordinarily controversial uh, to this day, and there are some people who are uh, uh, starting new projects to prove that you should not do it this way, that the Wikipedia will become self-limiting. But it would be as if some major long-form programming series on public broadcasting, which was being done by teams of people who are the best at their business, who've been doing this for a long time, decided to let anybody who wanted to be part of the production team. And yet, it works. So, it is radical. And it's redefining the reference genre of what a reference work is Future generations are going to look back and, and say, so you had this Encyclopedia Britannica, but it wasn't current? So if something happened in the world, the article didn't just automatically update itself? That's crazy. How could you use it? <laughs> it's supported by donations, um, but there is a commercial advertising-based spin-off. And I'll talk a little bit about, I have a couple slides left, about, about advertising. Um, so here's what I'd like you to think about. Could there be a Linux or Wikipedia of television for the 2010s? Something not yet seen, not clearly visible yet. It's have a new structure, a new content, a new process, but that's going to drive the whole landscape. If I were betting, that's where I would put my bet, because that's what's happened in each of the previous waves of disruptive technology. It doesn't mean everything else will become extinct, but it, if history follows the pattern, it will transform everything else in important ways. And what that really means is that existing stakeholders will have to adapt to it and not vice versa. So there are some very big stakes here, and that's what has happened in each of the other uh, regimes. Some big implications. The biggest challenge is over-attachment to old methods and mindset threaten survival. Remember, the things that made you succeed are the things that are going to make you fail. Suggest figuring out what your sacred cows are because those are the ones that you're going to have to experiment around. And those experiments ought to be bold. 
Uh, Kodak waited perhaps too long before embracing digital photography. We'll see. Jury is still out, but they were not, they understood it was coming, uh, but they did not move uh, uh, very quickly. I will say, so, the, will say, though, that if you make a more radical experiment, it needs special protection. It has to be firewalled off. Because anything sufficiently different to sort of thrive in a very different new world is going to look like some type of foreign invading body. And the institutional antibodies will be dispatched by the institutional immune systems to attach it. And, and good management involves um, firewalling it off. And the other thing to say is you don't have to be a first mover. There's a lot of literature and innovation that suggests being a fast follower is as good or better than a first mover. There's a very high mortality rate to first movers. Uh, but fast followers who watch what's succeeding and pick up on it and build, typically for established institutions, do the best. So three things to think about. It may be the case in some instances starting over is a better solution than solving this rights clearance problem. The momentum, well, I, Rick made the case perfectly well and I don't need to make it again. The momentum you can get when people can do what they want to do and can, can drive the system forward uh, can give you astounding momentum. And while culturally it would be pretty painful to have to leave behind perhaps for a generation or two, all of the great encumbered archives in doing things, it's not as crazy as it sounds that major new works can be done from scratch in short periods of time. Look at Linux and look at the Wikipedia. Second, crazy idea, social production of video content. Yochai Benkler is coming tomorrow. He'll talk about social production. But basically, I mean the idea that the production team could be hundreds or thousands of people. That is actually... Uh, I believe meaningful, interesting. I've heard today about some beginning experiments around that. I suspect that in the next five years we're going to see some pretty bold experiments and some, some interesting results. And then finally, to look back at advertising, when I was growing up, what distinguished public broadcasting from commercial <laughs> television was one had advertising and one didn't. We all know that the world has gotten very complex since since we were all growing up. Over at the Mozilla Foundation, where we had the issue of how we sustain the Firefox uh, web browser, um, we were fortunate in being able to do a deal with, uh, with Google and then later with other uh, search engines. So when people search in Firefox uh, and and, and the search is done within Google, but they're using the browser to do the search, and somebody clicks on an ad, uh, the Mozilla Foundation gets one billionth of a cent or some small amount of money. But since there are hundreds of billions of searches, it turns out it's an enormous amount of money, and the Mozilla Foundation is an advertiser-supported medium, although people don't think of it that way, and when they do, they've generally found it non-objectionable uh, the advertising obviously is, 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 is of a very different kind, but I am cautiously encouraged that there may be non-compromising ways of rethinking advertising, not compromising as far as the support of uh, the public mission goes. So uh, I'm actually cautiously optimistic about this because I think one thing is we learn as a society, and I know that people here do not have the kinds of resistance to change that doomed digital equipment corporation. It's an exciting kind of time, but I would, as a last word, encourage people to, now is the time to be bold. Thank you.
your understanding that um, you can use the free to support the pain. Um, because I, I work for Frontline, and we have a lot of big streaming. And um, there's, a, there's an ongoing conversation just about the idea of what if you, if you allow something to be free, are you going to lose dollars because of the public? We do sell things. Um, so I'm wondering if you can illuminate for me how it is that cannibalization hasn't really entered this conversation. Um, so in the most... This is a big discussion, but just a, a, a couple general points about it. I mean, think of back in the old days, I would listen to uh, rock and roll radio far too much until my mom, you know, took my radio away for a while because I wasn't doing my homework. And I could listen to music for free. And then I went out and bought records. It's kind of a very basic example that we're all familiar with, the free tier promoting the paid tier. These days, a lot of independent artists give away tracks online, and they hope that they'll sell you know, some stuff through iTunes or through one of the other services or maybe sell that way. That's practice. I mean, we do it. it, it, it it's just... It, it's funny because it's slightly different audiences. You know, um, we're giving out stuff to a retail audience, and the people that buy our footage are a much, much smaller group of media producers. But it trickles up. It, it just, it, I, I don't know the exact process, but it works that way. But here's the theory, and this is a new theory. This is maybe kind of almost a, a kind of consonant with what Mitch is talking about. One way of thinking about, and forgive the word, I'm just using it as a placeholder, content. One way of thinking about content is that it's the new infrastructure. If we take all of the material that we are able to make available pretty freely and openly, whether it's public domain, whether it's a government document, whether it's licensed, whether it's available through CC or by permission. If we think of that as infrastructure, then it becomes this commonly available body that anybody can build services on top of. And by services, it could be search, it could be programming, it could be uh, video on demand. Those services could be free. They could could be paid, but the point is that we're all drinking the water. We're just selling different, selling it in different kinds of bottles, and so that's another sense in which, um, and, and I think it's a background to a lot of what we're talking about. We create a huge body of material that's more or less open, and then we think about what we can sell on top of it. And I think that that's a really viable way of thinking. Um, and when you say content is infrastructure, it's hard because some people see it as almost an insult. It's an honor actually. If you're going to be the building blocks that other people are going to build with, that's an honor. If you're going to be part of the cultural DNA, it's not dishonorable. Um, I just want to add to that answer. <clears throat> um, it's, it's true, and it's sort of come up throughout the day where we tend to talk about audiences in these spaces as if, as if they're undifferentiated, but they're very different, and I think that um, there's sort of a centrifugal strategy that makes sense when you're talking even about the public broadcasting or a station perspective on this, which is where at a moment where you want to both aggressively be syndicating content openly um, to reach people often who aren't part of our broadcast audience at all, um, but who are going to these other spaces where they are encountering free content. At the same time as you want to, closer to the core of your service, be providing perhaps free content, but also additional services that are much more around the engagement piece. Um, so you have this kind of expanding circle um, where you really need to be doing both at once. The opportunities for something that I think we're much more comfortable with around engaging with audiences, adding certain things that might be membership-based, um, happen closer to the core. At the same time, we're trying to openly syndicate, often to places where people aren't encountering the, the brands or the institutions in the same way at all. Seven hundred million dollars. So Seven hundred million dollars for something where he doesn't produce any intellectual property. 
if the users are producing all of it. So you have this funny collision here between economic models and we're, the economic, what my question is about the economics of it. Somehow there's a value to the providers here, which is not measured in classic intellectual property monetary terms. It's fame, it's usability, it's exposure, it's, it's credit. And I don't think anybody's actually trying to systematically think about how do you do the economics of something uh, where the, the, the payment is fame, credit, and so I teach a course in this at Berkeley, and we teach the economics of open source on Monday, so I can try to summarize what we said. It looks more like a paradox about what's the economic motivation for people to contribute content uh, when you have look at it through the lens of conventional economics, uh, which says people only do things for narrowly self-interested reasons. It turns out that the dilemma goes away if you have a more accurate view of human nature, which is that, in general, people have multiple needs, and they have large needs for affiliation, connection, community participation, recognition. Uh, that's what it is to be human. And it's a bundle of those needs, different bundles in different uh, uh, contexts that uh, are the motivators. And that the real problem is, is we lack the tools in economics to accurately characterize human behavior. It's only when we stereotype it down in a narrow way that we, 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 we create these problems for ourselves. So it's really, it's a challenge uh, for the economists to have a more naturalistic uh, ex explanation of it. And, and that's a big intellectual challenge, but no one who has participated or observed any of these communities for any time can, can doubt the, 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 the awesome and, and, and ferocious desire to participate and, and contribute uh, on multiple levels from you know, MySpace to Wikipedia. And believe me, those two things are pretty different. I have a question for Rick. Um, I am, as you know, Rick, you are one of the only, if not the only archive, which offers content for free um, out there in the archive world. My question is, do you think that uh, your system or, or model would be as successful if you weren't offering public domain footage? And what would have been the, uh, what would have happened if you were offering people and clips for that matter? Um, the it wouldn't work as well if I had to pay 50% to somebody else who'd shot it, that's for sure. Um, on the other hand, uh, if, if, if there was a cooperative or a nonprofit marketplace, which could be run by an entity like WGBH, which has a very nice framework already set up, um, it could, uh, you know, independent creators of material could deal directly with, with users and there would, uh, very little money would have to be taken off the top and I think that they would find, you know, the problem, I mean, I think we all have the problem of rising out of the mosh pit and, and making our material visible, right? It's the old 500 channel cliche, it's the video on demanding. We are a lot more visible because we're one of only, I think, two stock footage companies that actually give material away no strings. So we're kind of lonely, but we profit from being lonely right now. It's the social paradox of, of some kind. It wouldn't work so well if everybody was doing it, but I, I, I think that, that there are means by which other people could do it as well. Is that responsive? Yes, but I'm also curious about the digitizing piece of it, because that's an enormous cost, and it is an enormous cost for us, and it's, uh, I'm just curious as what you launched the Internet Archive, how much was digitized. I don't know if it's yes, key. How no, to it. absolutely. I will totally okay. explain it. So um, when we, when I first uh, uh, met up with with Brewster, that fateful meeting, I had about three hundred hours of material mastered. We digitized that, and we were getting quotes from like Loud Eye. You know, it'll be two thousand dollars a minute to digitize, and we got to do three passes and all this. <laughs> It's sort of crap. I mean, really. So now we digitize using commodity equipment for between 15 and 20 an hour. The Internet Archive has a contractor with a whole bunch of machines. It's exactly what Vanderbilt did, you know, when they decided to digitize all their umatic tapes. That's about what they're, they're even paying a little less because labor costs are lower in Nashville. They pay about 12 an hour to digitize. It's actually easier to digitize video than it is to do audio because there's more decisions. Now, bear in mind, we're not digitizing for preservation. We're not doing what CNN has done or what uh, WNET is working on. We're digitizing for access. 
So we only had 300 hours. That wasn't enough to build this site. So um, the Internet Archive, basically Brewster's foundation, Kale Austin, subsidized a whole bunch of film-to-tape transfer for material that we only had on film. At this point, that's a, still a bit of a roadblock, but it's getting better. It is now a lot cheaper to go from film to video and even from film to bits. There's ways to do it that don't involve spending 500 per operator hour, which translates into 1500 or 2,000 per program hour. So it's easier. But that's what happened. There was a hidden subsidy there. But when you divide it by the number of downloads, it's peanuts. But then what about Getty? Getty came into the scene. Don't, didn't you then be higher res video at that point? Did they, did they digitize all of them? Getty has all my... Getty has, has copies of all our tapes in New York, and so they do their thing. And, you know, I had a loophole in my contract with them. I love Getty Images. They do make us a lot of money. Um, I thought they'd freak out because I had a loophole that allowed me to do stuff with entire films. They sell clips. And, you know, they point to the Internet Archive because they realize that it it's free visibility for them and it doesn't hurt their licensing. They, they know these figures better than I do. I want to know if um, this is a really fantastically well documented, fantastic success story. So, why doesn't everybody do it? Um. The stock footage industry is not one of the more progressive economic sectors. I mean, really, you know, it's a mom and pop business. Um, it's people who, it's a model of scarcity. I mean, I used to do this. We didn't release anything to anybody unless it had time code obliterating the images. I always get my masters back. People tell stories about me going through the cutting rooms at ABC News after shows are over, pulling my tapes off the shelf. You know, I used to be real hardball about this kind of thing. But it, it, it turns out it's better this way. Um, but you know, other people have their business models, which um, I haven't managed to disrupt yet. <laughs> yeah, people, it just seems to be a fundamental characteristic of human behavior. They're, we're attached to what we have, and if it's working, it's very difficult to give up. There's a great book by Jared Diamond, some of you may know, called Collapse. And it goes through how this happens on a level of a whole society. And what was this, the, the person who was chopping down the second to the last tree on Easter Island thinking? <laughs> so we know what the last person was thinking. <laughs> can, I, can I do a follow-up to that real quick? So, okay, suppose, um, suppose some people that were close to public television or maybe basic cable documentary decided that they would raise the money to digitize all the digibetas in the National Archives, which documentary producers rely very heavy on. It wouldn't cost, it would cost about $500,000, which is the budget for an hour of HBO, right? An hour of Spike Lee and the levees, I guess. Um, that would mean that suddenly, if you put that stuff online in high bandwidth, it would mean that suddenly everybody would have access to this body of footage. It would drive the cost of documentary production way, way down. How would you all feel about that? Uh, this is Mitch. Um, I'm not sure uh, how to put this, but is, is the sacred cow the uh, long format, high price? Uh, high quality documentary or um, public television format that we now see, or do you still see a bridge between this model and what we have now? I'm sure there are sacred cows, but the people in the community would know as an outsider, I don't, I'm not culturally competent yet to say what that is. There's probably more than one. Um, and some of them, I mean, I'd never had this thought until I was sitting in this morning. I don't think that even the, the long-form documentary, it, it resembles in a lot of ways how complex open source software projects are done. And as I was saying, I put in that point about reserving the final cut. I think that the idea that you either have control or no control is not right. I think that there are other models by which people with skills and talents exercise 
their influence and even a kind of authority, but they do it in these communities of many thousands of people. It's an experiment that's we're just, you know, so, someone needs to try who is a really great producer of documentaries to go and see what happens if you open up a process. Because it could work. And, and to follow up on that, if you... Um if you're not quite sure what the final outcome is going to be, uh, which I guess is probably true, but, you must have it, but um, if you're even less sure, um, or if you're even less sure of the high quality product that you're going to get at the end of this because you have so much input from so many uh, different sources, uh, do you see the ability to raise funds from the, from the outset as being harder? Well, you know, these open contribution systems have a set of dynamics that are not necessarily apparent from the outside. I'll just give you one, which is that assuming you get going and have some momentum, you then have a community of hundreds of thousands of people that has an investment in the thing actually being completed. And it, there may be a lot of laborious discussion, but it's the common commitment to get something done rather than nothing is one of the reasons that people surrender a certain amount of control or authority to people who seem to merit it. So, uh, you know, forking is a term of art in open source when a bunch of people say, well, we just don't like what you're doing and we're going to make our own version and we're going to start from exactly where you are because that gives us the right to do it. The, there's much less forking than you would expect because there are all of these hidden forces for cohesion that tend to hold things together. Not always. So, yeah, the first few times this happens, it's going to be risky and there are going to be some failures. And that's why I say, properly speaking, it has to be done by people with an appetite for risk. And by the way, the economics of it shouldn't be thought of in terms of the old economics because the volunteers are contributing their labor at, I mean, I don't know how you solve all the union problems, but, you know, um, uh, it's a different economics in which there's, you could say, a great deal of user-generated content. And so the, the budget for some of these first experiments should be, you know, an order of magnitude less, not, not zero. Uh, it, does, it does skip, though. We did say, yeah. assuming you get going. Assuming, assuming you get going. How do you get going? That's, that's where well, our I, funding process. I, I suspect, to be, to be realistic about this, you will be fast followers, not first movers. And somebody outside the system without credentials is going to do a really pretty great piece of work this way, rough. But people will look at it the way they looked at Linux about 1997 and said, ooh, not quite ready for prime time, but this is going to get there. So scan the environment, and once that happens, go and learn from all their mistakes and steal their ideas because the risk is the risk at that point is, is, is a lot lower. That's how most of these things get going. Not elegant, but it works. What, what does seem to happen in, in showbiz is that a lot of times style gets assimilated rather than sort of the the structure of production. So an example, I mean if you've ever looked at any of the long documentaries that have been made by indie media type people, um, if you look at uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, it's very indie media. It's like, uh, you know, indie media works for free and they do these things collectively and different groups from around the country collaborate. And then Michael Moore comes up and picks up the style and makes a big budget documentary. So there's that extra twist in showbiz. <laughs> Everybody leaving here, I guess, but I, it was actually partly responsive, partly asked here, but the, the difference between these open collections like uh, YouTube, which are uncurated, and Wikipedia and Linux, in which in both cases there is God. And so I guess one of the things that nobody has quite been able to focus on, the reason you go to public TV or to public radio is that they, you're hiring some smart person filter out all the noise and create a theme. And in a way, that, you, you, you can have yeah, a collective model to build, build a cathedral, but somebody has to have a vision where there has to be some process where there, there is an editorial decision that has to be I wouldn't pay for that. I, I, I think that's, that's half right. No, seriously, there is an editorial process of quality improvement in Wikipedia, but it's not Jimmy Wales doing anything. He makes, you know, when, when the system really 
screws up, he has the moral authority to help, you know, to, to bring it back. But the community as a whole pays a lot of attention to common uh, norms they have about uh, equality. So articles should have a neutral point of view. I mean, endless volumes have been written about what that is and what it isn't, and can you really have it? But in practice, people um, adhere to it. And there are lots of cultural practices in the Wikipedia community, very widely distributed, and that to become a Wikipedian is to absorb those and act that way, and those all contribute to the overall quality. So I think that there are parallels that communities can have shared norms and shared practices. And in fact, the development of a successful community-based way of, say, doing a documentary, uh, I predict will absolutely depend on the fact that, so, that there are shared values and shared practices. What those are, well, that's for the people who have the passion to do this and the expertise to go and see what works and what doesn't work. One set of things works in software. Software is a very different medium than text. A different set of things work in uh, the Wikipedia, and that's good for encyclopedias. Uh, nobody has yet put together the right thing in, in journalism and, and news, but there are some interesting experiments going on. And so different forms will have to work differently through a process of cultural invention. Uh, one more point, just following on that. <clears throat> sort of, Rick had mentioned this idea of content as infrastructure when we're at such a point of abundance of content mo motivated by some of these other non-market factors that is now outpouring everywhere. And the YouTube example, um, it is sort of, you know, your immediate experience of dropping into the site is that it is uncurated. They did launch this thing This led to an idea that I wanted to pitch earlier, which is, Users can create channels. Right now, any user, I have a user account on YouTube, I can create a channel. I'm just choosing videos on YouTube, and then you can subscribe to my channel. Um, short of deciding which kinds of content you can clear at GBH to offer out in an open environment, um, it, when content is infrastructure and the services and roles you play on top of that infrastructure become a value, um, just the, that editorial filter, that curation that you were just alluding to becomes a valuable one. And there's an opportunity on YouTube right now um, for a public media institution to create a channel um, that would start to sift through the hundreds of thousands of videos, some subset of which actually I think would meet the kind of uh, mission filter of uh, educational use and sort of inspiring and uh, entertaining and that kind of a thing, which right now would actually be a really valuable service. If there was a GBH channel, um, not of GBH content necessarily, or perhaps you could clear some stuff that's already in the sandbox and put it in there, but if I knew or you advertised the fact that there was a GBH channel on YouTube, I bet you'd actually get quite a lot of subscribers to that channel because exactly what you said is a need um, on top of this ocean of, of work. Did you make it clear whether the materials on PRX are mashable? Um, they're not, unless a producer um, chooses that as a license option. And we had, um, when we launched PRX, when we were designing it in 2002, it was right when the board of Creative Commons was at Berkman Center designing that. And so I, I bought the domain in Radio Commons, um, waiting for the moment to be able to start to offer that as a license option for any producer who has a piece on PRX to put it out under any one of the Creative Commons choices, which we are gearing up to do and haven't yet done. Um, but you know, most, I'd say, of the producers on the site, there's such a wide variety. We have you know, NPR has stuff on the site, as do the high school radio producers, as do you know, Radio Netherlands and Australia. There's a, that has to be something that they would opt into, but I imagine a huge chunk of it would be available under those terms. So that level of openness is not yet there, but it's seen as an option in the continuum. Yes. Any more questions? Uh, I have a question for Jake. Uh, I'm just wondering how much do you all sustain yourself through subscriptions, which I gather is largely how you run the business, and how much is through grants or through CDB money? Well, uh, right now it's like 80% grants. Um, the idea was over, we had hoped over five years we'd be able to get to maybe more 50-50, which is actually not far off from a lot of the ways that public media institutions, even at the NPR level, kind of run. But core operations are really funded by some of those grants. We've grown from it being zero to about, you know, 15 to 20 percent from direct revenues from our piece of the kind of digital distribution. Um, but we see that growing. Largely, you know, we've been sort of leaking it through these station schedules, choosing to broadcast things. but. We notice in the, in the listener traffic coming to review and the Google Analytics that we see um, a huge appetite for a lot of the work there. And as we begin to sort of free it up 
both through station websites and through these third-party platforms, we imagine that both sort of an ad-supported version and a direct paid version um, will help our bottom line as well. So in, in both these examples, we're looking at grant-supported startup and not not at the level of sustainability yet. And do you argue sustainable yet? at this point from the um, we're just part of the overhead of the Internet Archive. We don't cost very much money. I think a couple years ago I figured out it cost two cents to serve up a film or something. But it's lost in the infrastructure. We're not, our bandwidth is nothing compared to all the Grateful Dead stuff <laughs> that's up on the Internet Archive. That's where the action is, you know. Um, we're like nothing. Uh, you know what was big? The Internet Archive has another 140,000 moving images up there. We host our media and we've got a big open source. What's big was the Tsunami home videos, you know, or the Eminem election video, which got a million hits in two days, which can cripple, you know, a little nonprofit like the Internet Archive. We, we can deal with that now, but um, we're peanuts by I comparison. I'd say one of the questions we didn't really get to today, and I know we're just trying to wrap up, but it seems like the, the open question about the fact that one of the most attractive, sustainable ways of pursuing open syndication and content is an ad-supported model. It aligns with the sort of aspirations of total reach and getting work out there. Um, we're at a sort of beginning of a wave of moving of ad dollars from broadcast into the Internet, so there's a huge amount of potential there. It's the way that so far the podcasting project in public radio has gone. It's the sort of model that I think people default to as they start to look at um, how that could be sustained and not just something that we're sending out um, with nothing coming back. Um, so actually teasing out what that means when we sort of start to forego probably the a la carte paid subscription membership donation and even philanthropic model um, I think is worthy of, of debate because it does seem as we talk about business plans that are being bandied about to be the sort of assumption that we have going into the field. <laughs>